Book One, Chapter Three, Part Two of Two of The Beautiful and Damned. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Beautiful and Damned by F. Scott Fitzgerald. Book One, Chapter Three The Connoisseur of Kisses. Part Two of Two. Magic. The stark and unexpected miracle of a night fades out with the lingering death of the last stars and the premature birth of the first newsboys. The flame retreats to some remote and platonic fire. The white heat has gone from the iron and the glow from the coal. Along the shelves of Anthony's library, filling a wall amply, crept a chill and insolent pencil of sunlight touching with frigid disapproval Therese of France and Anne the Superwoman, Jenny of the Orient Ballet, and Zuleika the Conjurer, and Hoosier Cora, then down a shelf and into the years, resting pityingly on the over-invoked shades of Helen, Thais, Salome, and Cleopatra. Anthony, shaved and bathed, sat in his most deeply cushioned chair, and watched it until at the steady rising of the sun it lay glinting for a moment on the silk ends of the rug, and went out. It was ten o'clock. The Sunday Times, scattered about his feet, proclaimed by rotogravure and editorial, by social revelation and sporting sheet, that the world had been tremendously engrossed during the past week in the business of moving towards some splendid, if somewhat indeterminate, goal. For his part, Anthony had been once to his grandfather's, twice to his broker's, and three times to his tailor's, and in the last hour of the week's last day he had kissed a very beautiful and charming girl. When he reached home, his imagination had been teeming with high-pitched, unfamiliar dreams. There was suddenly no question on his mind, no eternal problem for a solution and resolution. He had experienced an emotion that was neither mental nor physical, nor merely a mixture of the two, and the love of life absorbed him for the present to the exclusion of all else. He was content to let the experiment remain isolated and unique. Almost impersonally, he was convinced that no woman he had ever met compared in any way with Gloria. She was deeply herself. She was immeasurably sincere. Of these things he was certain. Beside her, the two dozen schoolgirls and debutantes, young married women and waifs and strays whom he had known, were so many females, in the word's most contemptuous sense, breeders and bearers, exuding still that faintly odorous atmosphere of the cave in the nursery. So far as he could see, she had neither submitted to any will of his, nor caressed his vanity, except as her pleasure in his company was a caress. Indeed, he had no reason for thinking she had given him aught that she did not give to others. That was as it should be. The idea of an entanglement growing out of the evening was as remote as it would have been repugnant. And she had disclaimed and buried the incident with a decisive untruth. Here were two young people with fancy enough to distinguish a game from its reality, who by the very casualness with which they met and passed on would proclaim themselves unharmed. Having decided this, he went to the phone and called up the Plaza Hotel. Gloria was out. Her mother knew neither where she had gone nor when she would return. It was somehow at this point that the first wrongness in the case asserted itself. There was an element of callousness almost of indecency, in Gloria's absence from home. He suspected that, by going out, she had intrigued him into a disadvantage. Returning, she would find his name and smile, most discreetly. He should have waited a few hours in order to drive home the utter inconsequence with which he regarded the incident. What an asinine blunder! She would think he considered himself particularly favored. She would think he was reacting with the most inept intimacy to a quite trivial episode. He remembered that, during the previous month, his janitor, to whom he had delivered a rather muddled lecture on the Brother Hoove Man, had come up next day, and, on the basis of what had happened the night before, seated himself in the window seat for a cordial and chatty half-hour. Anthony wondered, in horror, if Gloria would regard him as he had regarded that man. Him! Anthony Patch! Horror! It never occurred to him that he was a passive thing acted upon by an influence above and beyond Gloria, that he was merely the sensitive plate on which the photograph was made. Some gargantuan photographer had focused the camera on Gloria and, snap, the poor plate could but develop, 
confined like all things to its nature. But Anthony, lying upon his couch and staring at the orange lamp, passed his thin fingers incessantly through his dark hair and made new symbols for the hours. She was in a shop now, it seemed, moving leisurely among the velvets and the furs, her own dress making, as she walked, a debonair rustle in that world of silken rustles and cool soprano laughter and scents of many slain but living flowers. The minis and pearls and jewels and jennies would gather around her like courtiers, bearing wispy frailties of georgette crepe, delicate chiffon to echo her cheeks in faint pastel, milky lace to rest in pale disarray against her neck. Damask was used, but to cover priests and divans in those days, and cloth of samarand was remembered only by the romantic poets. She would go elsewhere after a while, tilting her head a hundred ways under a hundred bonnets, seeking in vain for mock cherries to match her lips or plumes that were graceful as her own supple body. Noon would come. She would hurry along Fifth Avenue, a Nordic Ganymede, her fur coat swinging fashionably with her steps, her cheeks redder by a stroke of the wind's brush, her breath a delightful mist upon the bracing air. And the doors of the Ritz would revolve, the crowd would divide, fifty masculine eyes would start, stare, as she gave back forgotten dreams to the husbands of many obese and comic women. One o'clock. With her fork, she would tantalize the heart of an adoring artichoke, while her escort served himself up in the thick, dripping sentences of an enraptured man. Four o'clock. Her little feet moving to melody, her face distinct in the crowd, her partner happy as a petted puppy and mad as the immemorial hatter. Then, then night would come drifting down, and perhaps another damp. The signs would spill their light into the street. Who knew? No wiser than he, they happily sought to recapture that picture done in cream and shadow they had seen on the hushed avenue the night before. And they might, ah, they might. A thousand taxis would yawn at a thousand corners, and only to him was that kiss forever lost and done. In a thousand guises Thais would hail a cab and turn up her face for loving, and her pallor would be virginal and lovely, and her kiss chaste as the moon. He sprang excitedly to his feet. How inappropriate that she should be out! He had realized at last what he wanted, to kiss her again, to find rest in her great immobility. She was the end of all restlessness, all malcontent. Anthony dressed and went out, as he should have done long before, and down to Richard Caramel's room to hear the last revision of the last chapter of The Demon Lover. He did not call Gloria again until six. He did not find her in until eight, and, oh, climax of anticlimaxes, she could give him no engagement until Tuesday afternoon. A broken piece of gutta percha clattered to the floor as he banged up the phone. Black Magic Tuesday was freezing cold. He called at a bleak two o'clock, and as they shook hands he wondered confusedly whether he had ever kissed her. It was almost unbelievable. He seriously doubted if she remembered it. "'I called you four times on Sunday,' he told her. "'Did you?' There was surprise in her voice and interest in her expression. Silently he cursed himself for having told her. He might have known her pride did not deal in such petty triumphs. Even then he had not guessed at the truth, that, never having had to worry about men, she had seldom used the wary subterfuges, the playings out and haulings in, that were the stock in trade of her sisterhood. When she liked a man, that was trick enough. Did she think she loved him? There was an ultimate and fatal thrust. Her charm endlessly preserved itself. I was anxious to see you, he said simply. I want to talk to you. I mean, really talk, somewhere where we can be alone. May I? What do you mean? He swallowed a sudden lump of panic. He felt that she knew what he wanted. I mean, not at a tea table, he said. Well, all right, but not today. I want to get some exercise. Let's walk. It was bitter and raw. All the evil hate in the mad heart of February was wrought into the forlorn and icy wind that cut its way cruelly across Central Park and down along Fifth Avenue. It was almost impossible to talk, and discomfort made him distracted, so much so that he turned at 61st Street to find that she was no longer beside him. He looked around. She was forty feet in the rear, standing motionless, her face half-hidden in her fur coat collar. Moved either by anger or laughter, 
He could not determine which. He started back. "'Don't let me interrupt your walk,' she called. "'I'm mighty sorry,' he answered in confusion. "'Did I go too fast?' "'I'm cold,' she announced. "'I want to go home, and you walk too fast. "'I'm very sorry.' Side by side they started for the plaza. He wished he could see her face. Men don't usually get so absorbed in themselves when they're with me. I'm sorry. That's very interesting. It is rather too cold to walk, he said briskly, to hide his annoyance. She made no answer, and he wondered if she would dismiss him at the hotel entrance. She walked in without speaking, however, and to the elevator, throwing him a single remark as she entered it. You'd better come up. He hesitated for the fraction of a moment. Perhaps I'd better call some other time. Just as you say. Her words were murmured as an aside. The main concern of life was the adjusting of some stray wisps of hair in the elevator mirror. Her cheeks were brilliant, her eyes sparkled. She had never seemed so lovely, so exquisitely to be desired. Despising himself, he found that he was walking down the tenth-floor corridor, a subservient foot behind her, was in the sitting-room while she disappeared to shed her furs. Something had gone wrong. In his own eyes he had lost a shred of dignity. In an unpremeditated yet significant encounter he had been completely defeated. However, by the time she reappeared in the sitting-room he had explained himself to himself with sophistic satisfaction. After all, he had done the strongest thing, he thought. He had wanted to come up, he had come. Yet what happened later on that afternoon must be traced to the indignity he had experienced in the elevator. The girl was worrying him intolerably, so much so that when she came out he involuntarily drifted into criticism. "'Who's this Blockman, Gloria?' "'A business friend of father's.' "'Odd sort of fellow.' "'He doesn't like you either,' she said with a sudden smile. Anthony laughed. "'I'm flattered at his notice. He evidently considers me a—' He broke off with— is he in love with you? I don't know. The deuce you don't, he insisted. Of course he is. I remember the look he gave me when we got back to the table. He'd probably have had me quietly assaulted by a delegation of movie soups if you hadn't invented that phone call. He didn't mind. I told him afterward what really happened. You told him? He asked me. I don't like that very well, he remonstrated. She laughed again. Oh, you don't? What business is it of his? None. That's why I told him. Anthony, in a turmoil, bit savagely at his mouth. Why should I lie? She demanded directly. I'm not ashamed of anything I do. It happened to interest him to know that I kissed you, and I happened to be in a good humor, so I satisfied his curiosity by a simple and precise yes. Being rather a sensible man, after his fashion, he dropped the subject. Except to say that he hated me. Oh, it worries you? Well, if you must probe this stupendous matter to its depths, he didn't say he hated you. I simply know he does. It doesn't worry— Oh, let's drop it, she cried spiritedly. It's a most uninteresting matter to me. With a tremendous effort, Anthony made his acquiescence a twist of subject, and they drifted into an ancient question-and-answer game concerned with each other's pasts, gradually warming as they discovered the age-old immemorial resemblances in tastes and ideas. They said things that were more revealing than they intended, but each pretended to accept the other at face, or rather word, value. The growth of intimacy is like that. First, one gives off his best picture, the bright and finished product mended with bluff and falsehood and humor. Then more details are required, and one paints a second portrait, and a third, before long, the best lines cancel out, and the secret is exposed at last. The planes of the pictures have intermingled and given us away, and though we paint in paint, we can no longer sell a picture. We must be satisfied with hoping that such fatuous accounts of ourselves as we make to our wives and children and business associates are accepted as true. It seems to me, Anthony was saying earnestly, that the position of a man with neither necessity nor ambition is unfortunate. Heaven knows it'd be pathetic of me to be sorry for myself, yet sometimes I envy Dick. Her silence was encouragement. It was as near as she ever came to an intentional lure. 
and there used to be dignified occupations for a gentleman who had leisure, things a little more constructive than filling up the landscape with smoke or juggling someone else's money. There's science, of course. Sometimes I wish I'd taken a good foundation, say at Boston Tech. But now, by golly, I'd have to sit down for two years and struggle through the fundamentals of physics and chemistry. She yawned. I've told you, I don't know what anybody ought to do, she said ungraciously, and at her indifference his rancor was born again. Aren't you interested in anything except yourself? Not much. He glared. His growing enjoyment in the conversation was ripped to shreds. She had been irritable and vindictive all day, and it seemed to him that for this moment he hated her hard selfishness. He stared morosely at the fire. Then a strange thing happened. She turned to him and smiled, and as he saw her smile, every rag of anger and hurt vanity dropped from him, as though his very moods were but the outer ripples of her own, as though emotion rose no longer in his breast unless she saw fit to pull an omnipotent controlling thread. He moved closer, and taking her hand, pulled her ever so gently toward him, until she half lay against his shoulder. She smiled up at him as he kissed her. Gloria, he whispered very softly. Again she had made a magic, subtle and pervading as a spilt perfume, irresistible and sweet. Afterward, neither the next day nor after many years could he remember the important things of that afternoon. Had she been moved? In his arms, had she spoken a little, or at all? What measure of enjoyment had she taken in his kisses? And had she at any time lost herself ever so little? Oh, for him there was no doubt. He had risen and paced the floor in sheer ecstasy. That such a girl should be, should poise curled in the corner of the couch like a swallow, newly landed from a clean, swift flight, watching him with inscrutable eyes, he would stop his pacing and, half shy each time at first, drop his arm around her and find her kiss. She was fascinating, he told her. He had never met anyone like her before. He besought her jauntily but earnestly to send him away. He didn't want to fall in love. He wasn't coming to see her any more. Already she had haunted too many of his ways. What delicious romance! His true reaction was neither fear nor sorrow, only this deep delight in being with her that colored the banality of his words and made the mawkish seem sad and the posturing seem wise. He would come back, eternally. He should have known. This is all. It's been very rare to have known you, very strange and wonderful, but this wouldn't do, and wouldn't last. As he spoke, there was in his heart that tremulousness that we take for sincerity in ourselves. Afterward, he remembered one reply of hers to something he had asked for. He remembered it in this form. Perhaps he had unconsciously arranged and polished it. A woman should be able to kiss a man beautifully and romantically without any desire to be either his wife or his mistress. As always when he was with her, she seemed to grow gradually older, until, at the end, ruminations too deep for words would be wintering in her eyes. An hour passed, and the fire leaped up in little ecstasies, as though its fading life was sweet. It was five now, and the clock over the mantel became articulate in sound. Then, as if a brutish sensibility in him was reminded by those thin, tinny beats that the petals were falling from that flowered afternoon, Anthony pulled her quickly to her feet and held her helpless, without breath, in a kiss that was neither a game nor a tribute. Her arms fell to her side. In an instant she was free. Don't, she said quietly. I don't want that. She sat down on the far end of the lounge and gazed straight before her. A frown had gathered between her eyes. Anthony sank down beside her and closed his hand over hers. It was lifeless and unresponsive. Why, Gloria! He made a motion as if to put his arm about her, but she drew away. I don't want that, she repeated. I'm very sorry, he said, a little impatiently. I, I didn't know you made such fine distinctions. She did not answer. Won't you kiss me, Gloria? I don't want to. It seemed to him she had not moved for hours. A sudden change, isn't it? Annoyance was growing in his voice. Is it? She appeared uninterested. It was almost as though she were looking at someone else. Perhaps I'd better go. No reply. 
He rose and regarded her angrily, uncertainly. Again he sat down. Gloria, Gloria, won't you kiss me? No. Her lips, parting for the word, had just faintly stirred. Again he got to his feet, this time with less decision, less confidence. Then I'll go. Silence. All right, I'll go. He was aware of a certain irremediable lack of originality in his remarks. Indeed he felt that the whole atmosphere had grown oppressive. He wished she would speak, rail at him, cry out upon him, anything but this pervasive and chilling silence. He cursed himself for a weak fool. His clearest desire was to move her, to hurt her, to see her wince. Helplessly, involuntarily, he erred again. If you're tired of kissing me, I'd better go. He saw her lips curl slightly, and his last dignity left him. She spoke, at length. I believe you've made that remark several times before. He looked about him immediately, saw his hat and coat on a chair, blundered into them during an intolerable moment. Looking again at the couch, he perceived that she had not turned, not even moved. With a shaken, immediately regretted, good-bye, he went quickly but without dignity from the room. For over a moment Gloria made no sound. Her lips were still curled, her glance was straight, proud, remote. Then her eyes blurred a little, and she murmured three words half aloud to the death-bound fire. "'Good-bye, you ass,' she said. Panic The man had had the hardest blow of his life. He knew at last what he wanted, but in finding it out it seemed that he had put it forever beyond his grasp. He reached home in misery, dropped into an armchair without even removing his overcoat, and sat there for over an hour, his mind racing the paths of fruitless and wretched self-absorption. She had sent him away. That was the reiterated burden of his despair. Instead of seizing the girl and holding her by sheer strength until she became passive to his desire, instead of beating down her will by the force of his own, he had walked, defeated and powerless, from her door, with the corners of his mouth drooping, and what force there might have been in his grief and rage, hidden behind the manner of a whipped schoolboy. At one minute she had liked him tremendously, ah, uh, she had nearly loved him. In the next he had become a thing of indifference to her, an insolent and efficiently humiliated man. He had no great self-reproach, some, of course, but there were other things dominant in him now, far more urgent. He was not so much in love with Gloria as mad for her. Unless he could have her near him again, kiss her, hold her close and acquiescent, he wanted nothing more from life. By her three minutes of utter unwavering indifference, the girl had lifted herself from a high but somehow casual position in his mind, to be instead his complete preoccupation. However much his wild thoughts varied between a passionate desire for her kisses and an equally passionate craving to hurt and mar her, the residue of his mind craved, in finer fashion, to possess the triumphant soul that had shone through those three minutes. She was beautiful, but especially she was without mercy. He must own that strength that could send him away. At present no such analysis was possible to Anthony. His clarity of mind, all those endless resources which he thought his irony had brought him, were swept aside. Not only for that night, but for the days and weeks that followed, his books were to be but furniture, and his friends only people who lived and walked in the nebulous outer world from which he was trying to escape. That world was cold and full of bleak wind, and for a little while he had seen into a warm house where fires shone. About midnight he began to realize that he was hungry. He went down into 52nd Street, where it was so cold that he could scarcely see. The moisture froze on his lashes and in the corners of his lips. Everywhere dreariness had come down from the north, settling upon the thin and cheerless street, where black bundled figures, blacker still against the night, moved stumbling along the sidewalk through the shrieking wind, sliding their feet cautiously ahead, as though they were on skis. Anthony turned over toward Sixth Avenue, so absorbed in his thoughts as not to notice that several passers-by had stared at him. His overcoat was wide open, and the wind was biting in, hard and full of merciless death. After a while a waitress spoke to him, a fat waitress with black-rimmed eyeglasses, 
from which dangled a long black cord. "'Order, please!' Her voice, he considered, was unnecessarily loud. He looked up resentfully. "'You want to order, or don't you?' "'Of course,' he protested. "'Well, I asked you three times. This ain't no restroom.' He glanced at the big clock and discovered with a start that it was after two. He was down around 30th Street somewhere, and after a moment he found and translated the child's in a white semicircle of letters upon the glass front. The place was inhabited sparsely by three or four bleak and half-frozen night hawks. "'Give me some bacon and eggs and coffee, please.' The waitress bent upon him a last disgusted glance, and, looking ludicrously intellectual in her corded glasses, hurried away. God! Glorious kisses had been such flowers! He remembered as though it had been years ago the low freshness of her voice, the beautiful lines of her body shining through her clothes, her face lily-colored under the lamps of the street, under the lamps. Misery struck at him again, piling a sort of terror upon the ache and yearning. He had lost her. It was true, no denying it, no softening it. But a new idea had seared his sky. What of Blockman? What would happen now? There was a wealthy man, middle-aged enough to be tolerant with the beautiful wife, to baby her whims and indulge her unreason, to wear her as she perhaps wished to be worn, a bright flower in his buttonhole, safe and secure from the things she feared. He felt that she had been playing with the idea of marrying Blockman, and it was well possible that this disappointment in Anthony might throw her on sudden impulse into Blockman's arms. The idea drove him childishly frantic. He wanted to kill Blockman and make him suffer for his hideous presumption. He was saying this over and over to himself, with his teeth tight shut, and a perfect orgy of hate and fright in his eyes. But, behind this obscene jealousy, Anthony was in love at last, profoundly and truly in love, as the word goes between man and woman. His coffee appeared at his elbow, and gave off, for a certain time, a gradually diminishing wisp of steam. The night manager, seated at his desk, glanced at the motionless figure alone at the last table, and then, with a sigh, moved down upon him, just as the hour hand crossed the figure of three on the big clock. Wisdom After another day the turmoil subsided, and Anthony began to exercise a measure of reason. He was in love. He cried it passionately to himself. The things that a week before would have seemed insuperable obstacles, his limited income, his desire to be irresponsible and independent, had, in this forty hours, become the merest chaff before the wind of his infatuation. If he did not marry her, his life would be a feeble parody of his own adolescence. To be able to face people, and to endure the constant reminder of Gloria that all existence had become, it was necessary for him to have hope. So he built hope, desperately and tenaciously, out of the stuff of his dream. A hope flimsy enough, to be sure, a hope that was cracked and dissipated a dozen times a day, a hope mothered by mockery, but, nevertheless, a hope that would be brawn and sinew to his self-respect. Out of this developed a spark of wisdom, a true perception of his own from out the effortless past. Memory is short, he thought. So very short. At the crucial point the trust president is on the stand, a potential criminal needing but one push to be a jailbird, scorned by the upright for leagues around. Let him be acquitted, and in a year all is forgotten. Yes, he did have some trouble once, just a technicality, I believe. Oh, memory is very short. Anthony had seen Gloria altogether about a dozen times, say two dozen hours. Supposing he left her alone for a month, made no attempt to see her or speak to her, and avoided every place where she might possibly be. Wasn't it possible, the more possible because she had never loved him, that at the end of the time the rush of events would efface his personality from her conscious mind, and with his personality, his offense and humiliation, she would forget, for there would be other men. He winced. The implication struck out at him. Other men. Two months. God. Better three weeks. Two weeks. He thought this the second evening after the catastrophe, when he was undressing, and at this point he threw himself down on the bed and lay there, trembling very slightly and looking at the top of the canopy. Two weeks, that was worse than no time at all. 
In two weeks he would approach her much as he would have to now, without personality or confidence, remaining still the man who had gone too far, and then, for a period in time that was but a moment, but in fact an eternity, whined. No, two weeks was too short a time. Whatever poignancy there had been for her in that afternoon must have time to dull. He must give her a period when the incident should fade, and then a new period when she should gradually begin to think of him, no matter how dimly, with a true perspective that would remember his pleasantness as well as his humiliation. He fixed, finally, on six weeks, as approximately the interval best suited to his purpose. And on a desk calendar he marked the days off, finding that it would fall on the ninth of April. Very well, on that day he would phone and ask her if he might call. Until then, silence. After his decision a gradual improvement was manifest. He had taken at least a step in the direction to which hope pointed, and he realized that the less he brooded upon her, the better he would be able to give the desired impression when they met. In another hour he fell into a deep sleep. THE INTERVAL Nevertheless, though, as the days passed, the glory of her hair dimmed perceptibly for him, and in a year of separation might have departed completely, the six weeks held many abominable days. He dreaded the sight of Dick and Maury, imagining wildly that they knew all. But when the three met, it was Richard Caramel and not Anthony who was the center of attention. The demon lover had been accepted for immediate publication. Anthony felt that from now on he moved apart. He no longer craved the warmth and security of Maury's society, which had cheered him no further back than November. Only Gloria could give that now, and no one else ever again. So Dick's success rejoiced him only casually, and worried him not a little. It meant that the world was going ahead, writing and reading and publishing and living, and he wanted the world to wait motionless and breathless for six weeks, while Gloria forgot. Two Encounters His greatest satisfaction was in Geraldine's company. He took her once to dinner and the theatre, and entertained her several times in his apartment. When he was with her she absorbed him, not as Gloria had, but quieting those erotic sensibilities in him that worried over Gloria. It didn't matter how he kissed Geraldine. A kiss was a kiss, to be enjoyed to the utmost for its short moment. To Geraldine things belonged in definite pigeonholes. A kiss was one thing, anything further was quite another. A kiss was all right, the other things were bad. When half the interval was up, two incidents occurred on successive days that upset his increasing calm and caused a temporary relapse. The first was, he saw Gloria. It was a short meeting. Both bowed, both spoke, yet neither heard the other. But when it was over, Anthony read down a column of the sun three times in succession without understanding a single sentence. One would have thought Sixth Avenue a safe street. Having forsworn his barber at the plaza, he went around the corner one morning to be shaved, and while waiting his turn, he took off coat and vest, and with his soft collar open at the neck, stood near the front of the shop. The day was an oasis in the cold desert of March, and the sidewalk was cheerful with a population of strolling sun-worshippers. A stout woman upholstered in velvet, her flabby cheeks too much massaged, swirled by with her poodle straining at its leash, the effect being given of a tug bringing in an ocean liner. Just behind them a man in a striped blue suit, walking slew-footed in white spatted feet, grinned at the sight, and catching Anthony's eye, winked through the glass. Anthony laughed, thrown immediately into that humor in which men and women were graceless and absurd phantasms, grotesquely curved and rounded in a rectangular world of their own building. They inspired the same sensations in him as did those strange and monstrous fish who inhabit the esoteric world of green in the aquarium. Two more strollers caught his eye casually, a man and a girl, then, in a horrified instant, the girl resolved herself into Gloria. He stood here powerless. They came nearer, and Gloria, glancing in, saw him. Her eyes widened, and she smiled politely. Her lips moved. She was less than five feet away. "'How do you do?' he muttered inanely. Gloria, happy, beautiful, young, with a man he had never seen before. It was then that the barber's chair was vacated, 
and he read down the newspaper column three times in succession. The second incident took place the next day. Going into the Manhattan bar about seven, he was confronted with Blockman. As it happened, the room was nearly deserted, and before the mutual recognition he had stationed himself within a foot of the older man and ordered his drink, so it was inevitable that they should converse. "'Hello, Mr. Patch,' said Blockman amiably enough. Anthony took the proffered hand and exchanged a few aphorisms on the fluctuations of the mercury. "'Do you come in here much?' inquired Blockman. "'No, very seldom.' He omitted to add that the Plaza Bar had, until recently, been his favorite. "'Nice bar. One of the best bars in town.' Anthony nodded. Blockman emptied his glass and picked up his cane. He was in evening dress. "'Well, I'll be hurrying on. I'm going to dinner with Miss Gilbert.' Death looked suddenly out at him from two blue eyes. Had he announced himself as his vis-à-vis -vis prospective murderer, he could not have struck a more vital blow at Anthony. The younger man must have reddened visibly, for his every nerve was an instant clamor. With tremendous effort he mustered a rigid, oh, so rigid, smile, and said a conventional good-bye. But that night he lay awake until after four, half wild with grief and fear and abominable imaginings. Weakness And one day in the fifth week he called her up. He had been sitting in his apartment, trying to read l'education sentimentale, and something in the book had sent his thoughts racing in the direction that, set free, they always took, like horses racing for a home stable. With suddenly quickened breath he walked to the telephone. When he gave the number, it seemed to him that his voice faltered and broke like a schoolboy's. The central must have heard the pounding of his heart. The sound of the receiver being taken up at the other end was a crack of doom, and Mrs. Gilbert's voice, soft as maple syrup running into a glass container, had for him a quality of horror in its single, hello -ah? Miss Gloria is not feeling well. She's lying down, asleep. Who shall I say called? Nobody, he shouted. In a wild panic he slammed down the receiver, collapsed into his armchair in the cold sweat of breathless relief. Serenade The first thing he said to her was, why, you've bobbed your hair. And she answered, Yes, isn't it gorgeous? It was not fashionable then. It was to be fashionable in five or six years. At that time it was considered extremely daring. It's all sunshine outdoors, he said gravely. Don't you want to take a walk? She put on a light coat and a quaintly piquant Napoleon hat of Alice Blue, and they walked along the avenue and into the zoo, where they properly admired the grandeur of the elephant and the collar height of the giraffe, but did not visit the monkey house because Gloria said that monkeys smelt so bad. Then they returned toward the plaza, talking about nothing, but glad for the spring singing in the air and for the warm balm that lay upon the suddenly golden city. To their right was the park, while at the left a great bulk of granite and marble muttered dully a millionaire's chaotic message to whosoever would listen, something about I worked and I saved and I was sharper than all Adam, and here I sit, by golly, by golly. All the newest and most beautiful designs in automobiles were out on Fifth Avenue, and ahead of them the plaza loomed up rather unusually white and attractive. The supple, indolent Gloria walked a short shadow's length ahead of him, pouring out lazy casual comments that floated a moment on the dazzling air before they reached his ear. Oh, she cried, I want to go south the hot springs. I want to get out in the air and just roll around on the new grass and forget there's ever been any winter. Don't you, though? I want to hear a million robins making a frightful racket. I sort of like birds. All women are birds, he ventured. What kind am I? Quick and eager. A swallow, I think, and sometimes a bird of paradise. Most girls are sparrows, of course. See that row of nursemaids over there? They're sparrows, or are they magpies? And of course you've met canary girls, and robin girls. And swan girls and parrot girls? All grown women are hawks, I think, or owls. What am I, a buzzard? She laughed and shook her head. Oh no, you're not a bird at all, do you think? You're a Russian wolfhound. Anthony remembered that they were white and always looked unnaturally hungry. 
but then they were usually photographed with dukes and princesses, so he was properly flattered. "'Dick's a fox terrier, a trick fox terrier,' she continued. "'And Maury's a cat.' Simultaneously it occurred to him how like Blockman was to a robust and offensive hog, but he preserved a discreet silence. Later, as they parted, Anthony asked when he might see her again. "'Don't you ever make long engagements?' he pleaded. "'Even if it's a week ahead, I think it'd be fun to spend a whole day together, morning and afternoon both.' "'It would be, wouldn't it?' she thought for a moment. "'Let's do it next Sunday.' "'All right. I'll map out a program that'll take up every minute.' He did. He even figured, to a nicety, what would happen in the two hours when she would come to his apartment for tea, how the good bounds would have the windows wide to let in the fresh breeze, but a fire going also, lest there be chill in the air, and how there would be clusters of flowers about, in big cool bowls, that he would buy for the occasion. They would sit on the lounge. And when the day came, they did sit upon the lounge. After a while, Anthony kissed her, because it came about quite naturally. He found sweetness sleeping still upon her lips, and felt that he had never been away. The fire was bright, and the breeze sighing in through the curtains brought a mellow damp, promising May and world of summer. His soul thrilled to remote harmonies. He heard the strum of far guitars and waters lapping on a warm Mediterranean shore, for he was young now, as he would never be again, and more triumphant than death. Six o'clock stole down too soon, and rang the querulous melody of St. Anne's chimes on the corner. Through the gathering dusk they strolled to the avenue, where the crowds, like prisoners released, were walking with elastic step at last after the long winter, and the tops of the buses were thronged with congenial kings, and the shops full of fine soft things for the summer, the rare summer, the gay promising summer that seemed for love what the winter was for money. Life was singing for his supper on the corner. Life was handing round cocktails in the street. Old women there were in that crowd, who felt that they could have run and won a hundred-yard dash. In bed that night, with the lights out, in the cool room swimming with moonlight, Anthony lay awake and played with every minute of the day, like a child playing in turn with each one of a pile of long-wanted Christmas toys. He had told her gently, almost in the middle of a kiss, that he loved her, and she had smiled and held him closer and murmured, I'm glad, looking into his eyes. There had been a new quality in her attitude, a new growth of sheer physical attraction toward him, and a strange emotional tenseness that was enough to make him clinch his hands and draw in his breath at the recollection. He had felt nearer to her than ever before. In a rare delight, he cried aloud to the room that he loved her. He phoned next morning, no hesitation now, no uncertainty. Instead, a delirious excitement that doubled and trebled when he heard her voice. "'Good morning, Gloria. Good morning.' "'That's all I called you up to say, dear.' "'I'm glad you did. I wish I could see you. You will, tomorrow night. "'That's a long time, isn't it?' "'Yes.' Her voice was reluctant. His hand tightened on the receiver. "'Couldn't I come tonight?' He dared anything in the glory and revelation of that almost whispered yes. I have a date. Oh, but I might, I might be able to break it. Oh, a sheer cry, a rhapsody. Gloria? What? I love you. Another pause, and then, I, I'm glad. Happiness, remarked Maury Noble one day is only the first hour after the alleviation of some especially intense misery. But, oh, Anthony's face as he walked down the tenth-floor corridor of the plaza that night. His dark eyes were gleaming, around his mouth were lines it was a kindness to see. He was handsome then, if never before, bound for one of those immortal moments which come so radiantly that their remembered light is enough to see by for years. He knocked, and at a word entered. Gloria, dressed in simple pink, starched and fresh as a flower, was across the room, standing very still and looking at him wide-eyed. As he closed the door behind him, she gave a little cry and moved swiftly over the intervening space, her arms rising in a premature caress as she came near. 
Together they crushed out the stiff folds of her dress in one triumphant and enduring embrace. End of Book One, Chapter Three, Part Two of Two